you know. So uh, anyway, chapter three picks up where he left off. So let's let's read beginning in verse one, uh, chapter three. Okay, read with me if you will in your own version. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no man may be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we've been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor should be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all, all our distress and affliction, we were comforted, uh, comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy? going to have to assign somebody to do this that doesn't have Alzheimer's. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 10. As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. That is the section of scripture that we're going to be covering today. If, if we were to put a, put a title on this, I, I want to use this one here and call it Timothy's After Action Report. And the reason for that is because I, I think it's a really good illustration. When I was in the military years ago, we would have certain uh, events or activities that we had to supply a report about that activity and various things that we were involved with, and it was called an after action report. And we would describe basically what we did, what went right, and what things could be done to improve it. That was an action, after action report. And what Timothy does here uh, is, is very much like that. Um, it begins here in verse 1, we, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left at Athens alone. So, you know, Paul, uh, it, his, the, the interruptions that Satan was putting forth got to be so difficult that he stayed behind. He, 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 had to, he left uh, the group, basically, and sent ended up sending Timothy because that's what verse 2 uh, tells us. And so anyway, just a number of questions kind of come up. You know, why why did he stay behind? Uh, why did he send just Timothy? Because Silas went uh, went elsewhere. Uh, there's, there's a lot of other questions that we might ask. You know, why, what, what is the biggest concern that Paul has on his mind? Or what's going through the Th these Thessalonian brethren as they're dealing with the gospel, growing in faith uh, apart from the ministers that established the gospel with them. And so those are, though, I think those are really good, uh, really good questions. So to begin with, when we look at verses two through five, we find here Paul's, you know, some of Paul's activities here be basically, basically begins with what he did. You know, and so he sends his emissary. He sends his uh, diplomat, as it were. He sends Timothy to the brethren there in Thessalonica. And he calls him our brother. You know, he, 
he is a uh, he is a part of the group. He's family. He is a brother in Christ that that has worked with Paul uh, in the past. He was God's fellow worker. This is a great term. You know, think about this for just a minute. To be called God's fellow worker, and that's that's what we are. Our Bible class teachers, uh, the stuff that we do behind the scenes in you know in the ministry, folks that we're trying to uh, trying to. I did buy uh, our most recent edition, so when we when we gather together for our card ministry, we'll be able to go through the newspaper and and write those things out and send them. You know, so that's that is uh, that is working with God because what's the goal? Well, God's goal is to get everybody in heaven, right? You know, I wish that all would come to uh, a state of knowledge. And we know that's not going to be the case There's, because Satan is so absolutely effective at what he does in twisting their minds away from things that are good and godly. And so anyway, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we are God's fellow workers, and that is definitely true. Timothy was described this way in Romans 16, 21, when Paul said there to the Romans that Timothy was my, uh, or Timothy, my fellow worker. And I want to read from Philippians chapter 2. This is verse 22. But you know this proven work that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. And this is the way that Paul describes Timothy. So what was Timothy's mission? What was he supposed to do? Why was he, what was, what specifically was Timothy uh, uh, setting out to do when he goes to meet with these brethren from Thessalonica? And we have this answer in verses 2 and 3 of our passage here in Thessalonians chapter 3. So the first thing that he was supposed to do was to strengthen and encourage them in their faith. This is verse 2. And, and that's good for all of us. We want to be encouraged in our faith. We want to know that what we are doing has some value, right? And so he's going to strengthen them in that. You know, I, it, there, there have been times when, you know, when I'm visiting with somebody about to part, I'll say, keep the faith. You know, keep the faith. That's what we're going to do is keep the faith. Verse 3, that no one, this is the second part of his goal there, was that no one would be unsettled by the trials. No one would be unsettled by these trials. That comes from verse 3. And so that's, that's what Paul did. He sent Timothy to these people. But Paul also provides a warning because he, he is... One of the things that Timothy is to do when he strengthens them is to warn them of the trials that they are going to endure. Trials are trials and difficulties and persecutions to whatever degree are going to be a part of the Christian's life. We cannot say uh, that when we come to Christ, it's all going to be a bed of roses. Uh, to use Doyle Gillen's phrase, my uh, teacher. But anyway, he, that's true. It's, it's, not, it's just not going to happen. We are destined for them. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18, reading through verse 20. <clears throat> this is what it reads there. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world... The world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute, uh, persecute you. It's going to happen. Uh, there's no way that a person can call themselves a child of God and not expect to uh, have some difficult times in that relationship with us. Uh, John 16 30, uh, 33 says some other things about the same thing. I'm going to read from 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. It says here uh, 
chapter 4. Uh, where is it here? Let me begin in verse 10. You followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance. Persecutions and suffering such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured and out of them all the Lord delivered me. So we can know that God's going to be with us through whatever, through whatever persecutions we deal with. He says in verse 12, And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Underline the word will in your Bible because it's a fact. It, it's going, you know, it's going to happen. You know, so we need to be prepared for that. And so that's the warning that Paul provides to these people. They had advanced warning. He says, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. Acts chapter, and this is from verse 4, uh, verse four there in uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, Acts 14, 22, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Um, John 16, the first two verses there. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time's coming when anyone who kills you will think that they're offering service to God. There are those who kill other people because they believe that they are doing this from a good and holy perspective. And that's just not what God would have us do. We don't win souls by taking the lives of others. Paul's heart, he had a deep concern about their faith. He was, he, and he would, you know. Um, notice what he says here. For this reason, when I can stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I, I couldn't, you know, how, how, how much sleep did Paul lose thinking about these, these Christians, you know? We can only speculate there, but he had to find out how they were doing, verse 5. And so Paul is also, when he talks about these things, he has a concern for the activities uh, that he was involved with when it came to sharing the gospel. And our efforts might have been useless, he says in verse 5. Failure of their faith during those trials would mean that Paul's efforts in Thessal Thessalonica would have been in vain. And, and that's uh, that's a troubling thing for preachers and teachers of God's word. You know, when our Bible class teachers, they spend their uh, time, their effort, um, oftentimes their own money, you know, to teach these young kids. They hope that they grow up being strong in the faith, and it is a saddening thing when, you know, when if the kids don't do that. It's the same way with, with parents, uh, grandparents. We do our best to uh, raise these young people in, uh, in an understanding of who God, Christ, and the Spirit are. And we don't want those activities to be in vain, nor did Paul. Philippians 2, 16, it says, As you hold out the word of life in order that uh, as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Galatians 2, verse 2, I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race uh, in vain. And so Paul doesn't want his efforts there in Thessalonica to be in vain. So he sends Timothy to find out how they're doing. And that, that leads us into the report that Timothy brought back. And this is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. And there's two areas of good news that he brings back from Thessalonica, from verses 6 and 7. First of all, good news, uh, Proverbs 25, verse 25, it says they're like cold water to a weary uh, to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. We like to hear that good news. I think that's one of the reasons why Dayonda wanted to go and see her grandkid. You know, she didn't want to just hear that good news. She wanted to experience it. You 
you know, so she was able to do that. Sometimes we're not able to do that. Paul wasn't able to do that because of the intense persecution going on against him. That's why he sent Timothy. And so that, that good news is very refreshing. And so in verse 6, there is some assurance about their faith and love. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith, we could say, and your love, just and love there. <clears throat> For now we really live since you're standing firm in the Lord. That is, that is good news. And so Paul was refreshed to be able to hear that his preaching had not been in vain. That the work that he and Silas and Timothy, when they brought the gospel to the Thessalonians, that what they were teaching them for that three-week period was met uh, uh, met very well. It was understood. It was accepted. And they were making it a part of their life. They were apprised of their pleasant memories. And uh, this is also from verse 8. You always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. And, and so, you know, we know what it's like to be separated from somebody that we love. You know, we were uh, reminiscing about those who had passed on uh, from us a few years ago, uh, as in the case of some family, Steve and Donna. And so we, we know what that's like. Um, it's, it's a tough thing sometimes. But when we're able to be united, that's a good thing. That's a very, a very good thing. So <clears throat> that's, that's the first part of the good news. He also, in, in this, from verse 8, uh, offers an admonition to stand firm. From 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Let me read a couple of passages here. This one says, be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. You know? It continues there because he talked about their faith and love here. From verse 14, let all that you do be done in love. You think that if we have a motivation to do something in love, if love is what motivates us, it helps us to withstand some persecution a little bit. I, I, I think that it might, you know, help us out there. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. One more passage from the Philippian letter uh, that tells us to stand firm. Verse 27 of chapter 1. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. With one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And, and so he wants them to stand. Uh, he wants them to stand firm. Um, the good news, of course, that Timothy brings back, brings some satisfaction uh, to Paul. It was, it was uh, somewhat, it, it revived his spirit. He says in verse 8, now we really live. It wasn't just, you know, that a life of anxiety is not good. And a lot of times what makes us, makes us anxious is not knowing the health or condition of somebody else. And so we worry about that. We're concerned about that. But when we find out things are going well with them, we can breathe that sigh of relief, right? We can just kick back and, you know, uh, instead of just looking at that glass of tea, we can enjoy it kind of thing, right? Um, anyway, Paul's life and happiness were wrapped up in his converse faithfulness. From 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 and 29, says, Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches, who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn? You know, that's kind of what Paul was revived from. The good news caused thankfulness in Paul. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of God because of you? 
Just saying thank you sometimes isn't enough, right? You know, just... Really, all we can say is thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. The Thessalonians, these are some of the reasons why they were thankful. The Thessalonians had turned from idols to serve the living God. Chapter 1, verse 9. Despite severe trials and persecution, they had persevered and grown in their faith and love. They were bringing out the message in Macedonia and Achaia in every place. Remember that from chapter 1? Let me, let me go, go back over there and uh, read that again. It says here, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every other place that uh, God's word has gone forth. So they were really setting a good example there. Uh, definitely a good reason to be thanking God, right? Another reason, they were living in order to please God. That's a good reason to live. Will I, do you wake up in the morning and say, will I be pleasing to God today? Will I be pleasing to God today? That is the highest pain, the highest goal. We may not reach that mark because, honestly, we know that sometimes we're weak and safe and busy, but it is a great aim to have each and every day. They were manifesting love to all the brothers throughout Macedonia, chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, they were encouraging, building each other up, chapter 5. Verse 11. So it's no wonder then that Paul felt incapable of thanking God enough for them. They were a dream congregation for any preacher, right? They were. Um, it's, uh, it is a great congregation to look to. How do we want our friend? If, if we were to look in Scripture to find out, okay, how, how what kind of what congregation would we pattern ourselves after? You know, we could go to those so seven congregations in uh, the the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, and we can find some very good examples there. But 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians is a good picture of a great congregation, you know, for us to pattern our lives after. We'll be able to deal with the persecutions that come before us. We'll be able to love each other the way that we ought to uh, be doing. It's not that they were perfect. We'll get into that here in a minute. But, but in any case, they were, uh, they were a very good example. The good news caused... Constant prayer by Paul. This is from verse 10. Night and day we pray most earnestly. And maybe, maybe, if, let me toss this out. Just kind of plop this in the back of your mind. If a congregation is not really what they ought to be, might part of the failure be because there's not enough prayer about that congregation? But, I think that from what I see right here, that could very well be the case. Because he says, night and day we pray, and they didn't just pray, they prayed most earnestly. And so two of the things that Paul prayed for, obviously, it was to see them again. Uh, you know, he, he wanted to see them again. But more importantly, I think, because sometimes we get to see uh, congregations again, and sometimes we don't get to, but it was to build up their faith. That's what God does. Romans 10, 17 is a perfect example. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If we're not hearing the Word of God uh, and uh, as much as we like, and we also have concerns about the level or condition of our faith, whether it is our personal faith or it is the faith that we should be contending for, maybe it's because we're not spending enough time in the Word of God. You know, so uh, supply what's lacking in your faith. Um, the, when it comes to the word, you know, the usage of your faith in this chapter, from verse 2, here's, here's just a few ideas. To encourage you in your faith. From verse 5, I sent to find out about your faith. From verse 6, he received good news about your faith and love. Verse 7, encouraged about you because of your faith. 
If faith is there, other things will fall into place. Their faith was not perfect. You know, it, it, you know some of the examples of what might have been lacking uh, could be found in some of the ex exhortations that we will read of in chapter 4 and 5. Number one, they had, there was a temptation, a possible temptation to revert to pagan se uh, sexual immorality. This is from chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. Uh, they, they may have had a problem of not minding their own business and providing for their needs. You know, um, sometimes we like to spend so much business uh, in the lives of others that we forget about what business we ought to be personally involved with ourselves. You know, if we're so much focused over here, how can I be focused here? I, you know, if, if, if I am really working on the kind of faith and example that I need to set here, do you think that might not rub off over here in whose life? And I'm not saying that we don't need to be concerned with what's going on in other people's lives because I, I, I think we do, you know. That's what Paul was doing when he was, when he was praying for their faith and their love, you know. Uh, keep standing firm. I'm praying that. So we do the same thing. And so... It just you know, just some more things to be to be mindful of. Thirdly, they had uh, they had some anxiety over the fate of a loved one who had died in the Lord. We do this. I I don't I don't like thinking about it in my own personal life. Um, you know because. There have been those in my family that have passed on, and as much as we would like to say everybody gets to go to heaven, Scripture obviously does not teach that. And so when people do stand before God, God in all fairness, God in all righteousness, judges some to a state of eternity that we wish wasn't the case. You know, and so I, I don't like to think about it a lot, you know, but um, but it's not wrong to have those concerns. We know that there will be a uh, that day. You know, at the end of each chapter in 1 Thessalonians, there is a comment to whatever degree, however long, however short, uh, but that comment has to do with the second coming of Christ. And so he wants the Thessalonians, he wants us to know that day will come. You know, that day will come. When it will come, we have no idea. It's going to be different for each of us until that day when Christ returns. And we need it anymore. You know, so uh, it, it's, you know, yeah, it's it's going to, it's going to happen. So anyway, um, chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 share that. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. You know, he says, don't concern. Don't, you know, don't. If, if we are... I listened to a fellow, uh, Mike, what is his name? Uh, if you have the, that uh, Bible Talk TV on your app, I think his last name is Meslonga, Mike Meslonga. He, he has a, a favorite passage of his, is Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 16. He, he says, you know, for, for people that aren't sure about their salvation, I, I don't have that concern. And I'll tell you why. And he quotes Mark 16, 15, 16. He says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's fact. He says, I trust that. Can I be assured of my salvation? I certainly can. I've been baptized. The way Scripture teaches that baptism ought to be done. And I believe uh, in, in the things that God has taught me. And so, am I going to heaven when I die? Yep. He's absolutely sure. And that's awesome. We can have that assurance. So if, so if we are focused on that and that alone, 
We don't have to worry like the Thessalonians were worrying. And Paul spent much time teaching them on that particular uh, situation there. So those are the concerns. So Paul, in verses 11 through 13, he has a prayer for the Thessalonian Christians. So, so Paul prayed to both Father and to Jesus. And let me begin by saying, if you don't think we can't pray to Jesus, here are some texts that say we can pray to Jesus. Let alone Acts chapter 7, where uh, what did Stephen say when he was being stoned to death for the gospel of Christ? He says, Lord Jesus, do not hold this sin against you. Those were his, his dying words, right? So anyhow, we can do that. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus uh, that's the address in his prayer. It is, it is scriptural to address prayer to both God and Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17 says, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. There is a short little powerful prayer that is offered to God and Jesus on behalf of us that he's praying for. The fact that appeals and prayer petitions are addressed by Paul to Jesus Christ as well as to the Father, it is a strong affirmation of the deity of both. We know that God is deity. There's, there's never been that issue, I think, amongst those who believe in God. All right? But when it comes to Jesus, there are some other questions. Was Jesus a created being? I don't see that in Scripture anywhere. People might go to uh, Colossians, I think it's chapter 1, uh, where it says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. I think it's chapter 2. But that passage is not talking about the creation of Jesus. It's talking about his preeminence when it comes to the gospel. Who was the first? Who, who set the example? Who fulfilled all righteousness when he was baptized? It was Jesus. Who was first resurrected? It was Jesus. That's what the Colossian letter is talking about. Paul's prayer involves three things. For God's providential guidance. He says in verse 11, to clear the way for us to come to you. We mentioned it in, in our Bible class this morning. Here's the question. Is there anything God cannot do? We know what the answer is. God can do anything God wants to do. According to our records, Paul did not return to Thessalonica immediately or soon after writing this letter. However, on his third journey, he did go through Macedonia where he traveled through that area speaking many words of encouragement to the people. We see this in Acts chapter 20, the first three verses. He did this in order that God would increase their love. And may the Lord God and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men. Verse 12. They were already loving. It says all the brothers throughout Macedonia, chapter 4, verse 10. Yet they needed to increase and overflow with such love. Can we ever love enough? Can we love enough? I think as long as we're on the face of this earth, there's always an opportunity for us to love just that much more. Just that much more. Just that much more. Right? <clears throat> there was an answered prayer. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. And the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. This is one of the marks of discipleship among God's people. You know that? We know this from John chapter 13, uh, 34 and 35. Says, A new commandment I give you that you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And first, Peter, Peter 
rephrases it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses, uh, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Peter, he just, it's just a great way for him to phrase that for us. And so Paul, in his prayer, also asked that God would empower them to be holy. May he give you inner strength that you may be blameless and holy. That's a great prayer. You know that? Think about it. Inner strength for the Ephesian church. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being. Chapter 3, verse 16. For the Colossian church in chapter uh, 1, verses 9 and 10, it says this. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respect, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. All those things are tied uh, together there in that verse. This is a, this really is a model prayer, I think, for all Christians. We could, we could and should pray these things for each of us, uh, for our brethren that are not here with us, for our brethren that meet in other places around the world. This is what, this is what we ought to be praying for. And we also ought to pray regarding that day and manner of the Lord's return. When our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones, the Lord's often pictured in the scripture as coming with his angels. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, Matthew 13, 41, also in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. And also God's people, the saints, return with him. Remember we read that just a moment ago from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. Again, each chapter in 1 Thessalonians closes with a reference to the second coming. Timothy's after-action report, you know, the, the things that Paul sent him to do, uh, the activities that Timothy involved himself with those of Thessalonica, bringing that report back to Paul. Uh, they all have to do with our eternal destination, and we're reminded at least five separate times in the, in the Thessalonian letters that uh, that there will be a second coming to which we will be a part of. That's the whole thing. And so that leads me to this question for us today. Are you ready for the Lord's return? Are you ready? Have your sins been washed away in the waters of baptism, according to Romans chapter 6, according to 1 Peter chapter 3, Acts chapter 2, uh, Acts chapter 22? Uh, Acts chapter 16, uh, the list goes on, you know, but if, if you have not done that, uh, we can take care of that for you today. If, if you have a prayer, uh, uh, you know, that there's something going on in your life and it's a persecution that, you know, you're dealing with and you need encouragement, you need strength, you know, just let us know if there's anything that we can do for you today while we stand in the same. Uh, ew, ew, ew. Ah. Stop playing.